and part of Nigeria past, present, and future. Uh, I thank believe, you. Thank you so much. I believe that uh, intro is acceptable to you. And if you want to add any other thing to it, feel free to do so. Or do we, do you, do I have your permission to continue? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, nothing to add. Thank you very much. And, and I greet our viewers uh, across the globe. Thank you. Thank you for this real privilege. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I should be thanking you. We want to look at matters arising in Nigeria. And I think you are suitably qualified to give your opinion on the state of affairs of our country. Uh, since May 29, we've had a new government that has come in, well, same party, but a new set of sheriffs in town. Uh, it's interesting that it's almost a clean sweep of uh, everybody else that was there before. You know, in other countries, you know, uh, it's a party thing. You know, Labour Party in Britain, they get a new prime minister, but you can almost tell who the ch chancellor of the exchequer will be. You can tell who the home affairs person will be. You can tell who this will be. Because they've all been part of the party. They've all been homogeneous. You might change one or two players, but most of the people, you know, it's still the same party. But all in right. Nigeria, it's almost as though a new party has come on board and all the other old people have been asked to leave and they almost have no opinion in what is going on. We'll be looking at that too, especially the ministerial list that is coming up. Um, we'll also look at the foreign exchange regime. You may have an opinion on too on that. But what we want to start off with is uh, based on your background in petroleum engineering and things like that, we really want you to explain to lay people like myself, what is this thing called petroleum subsidy? What does it mean? What does it imply? What are the gains and the losses? Some people are shouting, keep the subsidy, blah, blah, blah. Some people are saying, no, remove the subsidy. My friend Lamido Sanusi since 2012 has been asking for the removal of this subsidy. Some people are saying, well, remove the subsidy, remove it systematically on a gradual basis. Some people are saying, when you remove subsidy, you must bring palliative, blah, 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 blah. What is this wizard called subsidy? What does it mean? What does it imply? What should we do? What are the pros? What are the cons? And so on and so forth. First, please educate us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you, and I, I appreciate our viewers uh, and listeners across the globe. Uh, my, my, my intention, or my, my hope actually here is this, is, this is not a discussion of us versus them. This is, this, I expect this to be very interactive, and let it be a discussion of us versus us. And when we look at it from, from that angle, then that means we are expected to be at resonance in our thoughts. Uh, in the course of this discussion, I will expect that what we are basically here to do uh, will be to, to share and cross fertilize knowledge in, in, in national interests or in Nigerian and Nigeria's interests. And, and, and in the interest of those I can technically describe as uh, friends and uh, lovers of, of Nigeria. Uh, uh, we're talking about, uh, generally when you talk about subsidy, you know, uh, my, my, my belief is that we are going to talk uh, probably about uh, the oil and gas industry, but, but subsidy is, is something that uh, is, is, is generic and uh, in the course of this discussion, I will, I will try as much as possible uh, to make sure uh, I, I am down to earth because uh, fortunately I learned, uh, we were taught a course in my undergraduate days called technical writing. And in technical writing, you are advised uh, as much as possible to carry everybody along. So because you are a lawyer or you are an accountant or an engineer, and you're coming up with all your, your jargons. If case not taken, uh, you won't be communicating. 
you know, you are you you will be talking, people will be hearing, but uh, probably they are not listening. And even if they are listening, they are not understanding. So as as uh, to a great extent, I will I will be down to it uh, in my discussions today. Thank you once again. You see, it's it's very very unfortunate that uh, in the context of Nigeria, uh, we, we 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 have people that that I uh, we describe as leaders, but unfortunately, uh, honestly to me, uh, if if you have to qualify leaders and you put them. You know, we have four quadrants. As far as I'm concerned, some of them are not qualified to be even in the first quadrant. Meanwhile, in real sense, you're supposed to have leaders that you technically call strategic thinkers in the fourth quadrant. Many of them are not qualified to, to be in, in the first quadrant. And please, in the course of this discussion, as much as possible, quote me. Quote me, feel free to quote me in everything. If I give you figures, quote me. If I if I analyze something, quote me, and I'm I'm willing to extend this this the, the, the discussion beyond where we are right now. Uh, ordinarily, leaders are supposed to be fellow citizens that other citizens elected and handed over their economic, political, and social destinies to manage in national interest. So when you, we, you hand over your, your social destiny, economic and political destiny for somebody to manage or in trust, we went further to say, let it be in national interest. And to that extent, if it is, it, it is expected that you will pray for your leaders, you will wish them well, you will want them to succeed. But you also have every right, not a privilege. You have the right to correct them. You have the right to challenge them. But everything you will do, do it in national interest. And I belong to the class of uh, global citizens that believe that nobody knows it all. In other words, everything we do has to do with synergy. You bring, I bring, she brings, he brings. And, 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 and we filter and resonate everything. We filter to make sure there is a common interest. So to that extent, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the economy of Nigeria today is, is at a crossroad, or, or at best is approaching a crossroad. That is what is happening to the Nigerian economy. And if you want, want to describe it in terms of, of ailment, I, I can say the Nigerian economy is cancerous today. It's prostrate. The only thing is somebody may say, well, is it, is it malignant or benign? I can tell you that it is not benign, it is not malignant but it is in between being benign and being malignant. And even if you're going to talk about a journey, I can tell you that the Nigerian economy is heading towards the evil forest. It is heading towards the evil forest, whether people accept it or not. That's what I believe. And I stand to be challenged, but I also stand, to, I can be corrected. You see, I have come to discover that in the context of Nigeria, it's very, very unfortunate that, 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 that many people don't even know the meaning of subsidy. But I will not be fair if I say people don't know the meaning of subsidy, because I know that, that Nigeria is, is, has a lot of educated people. Nigeria has a lot of intellectuals. And I know that, I mean, Nigeria ordinarily is supposed to be the continental hub for Africa in virtually everything. I don't need to itemize them. I hear people saying, and I had the opportunity of traveling far and wide, and I know how, how Nigerians excel. But, but down home, it is very clear that something is wrong with Nigeria. It's either that those we have as technocrats decided to reduce themselves to, to praise singers, or it's true that they don't know what they are talking about. And, 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 and or, or they know, and they wouldn't want to say it for whatever reasons. But, 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 but as far as I'm concerned, somehow, somewhere, something is wrong with Nigeria. Subsidy is, is not a Nigerian creation. Subsidy is, is a global thing. And subsidy is associated with governments of nations. People should look at it from that angle. Even in the dictionary, if you check, you find out that subsidy is associated with governments. So when I hear people saying it is the, the, the private sector that is supposed to create jobs and whatever, private sector 
is a corporate citizen. Private sector is a citizen. You have individual citizens and you have corporate citizens. So private sector is a corporate citizen. It is the government of nations that will provide goods and services and provide the enabling environment. But in the context of Nigeria, somehow, somewhere, we have been bullheaded. We have been hit, we have been choked to the point where we, we, we don't even know or we don't want to accept that it's government. But let me say this, you know, children are to parents the way citizens are supposed to be to government. Everything we do for our children today, I can tell you, is, is we provide subsidy for them. And it is our prayer and hope that they will grow and get to a particular point where they will support us. And quote me that some children may end up supporting parents, some children may end up causing more problems or headache to parents. That's the case. So in the, in the context of government, it's the same. Government is supposed to provide, but let me define subsidy generally. Subsidy, my own way, you know, subsidy is a globally accepted, it's a globally tested and a globally verified economic pain cushioning concept. So subsidy is supposed to level and cushion pains and subsidy is provided by governments. When you hear subsidy being provided by individuals or corporate citizens, I mean, you don't call it subsidy, you call it discount. Discount is associated when you're talking about businesses, but subsidy is a global concept. And to that extent, if subsidy is not working in your own country, you, that will never in any way invalidate or vitiate the, the meaning of that concept. All you need to do is to check it within your client why subsidy is not working. In the context of Nigeria, I can tell you the only reason why people are saying Pa Awolowo was great, Pa Awo was this, Pa Awo was that, was just because he provided subsidy in education. That was just the thing. And he didn't provide it as Pa Awolowo, he provided it as a government probably Western region or premier of Western region or whatever. That was what was provided. Then in the context of Nigeria, like I said, we need subsidy in health. We need subsidy in education. We need subsidy in sports. We need subsidy in security. We need subsidy in virtually everything. And like I said, children are to parents what citizens are to government. And you must be nurtured, you must be taken care of to a particular point when you will now start contributing. And when you start contributing, then either as individual or corporate citizens, there are obligations. But in the context of Nigeria, we abdicated our responsibilities. I know we are trying to talk about the oil and gas industry. And remind me, I will talk about the upstream, I will talk about the downstream, and I will talk about the midstream, though we all know that the midstream does not exist in Nigeria. But let me just give a general scenario. We know what Nigeria is going through now, and we know where we are. Quote me that I said, at the, considering the track we are on, we are already on the wrong track. And anybody that tells you that we will get it right if we continue without coming back, that person is, is just dishonest. A practical example, I know, I mean, we are being viewed across the globe, but I just want to tell you or tell you, ask you one, one question or describe something. For those who are in Lagos, I want to say for those who are in Lagos and have had the opportunity of going to a place we call Marina, or you can Google Marina and see. Opposite Marina, you will see so many ships, so many tugboats, so many vessels, and for those who are familiar with the oil and gas industry, you will see so many swan badges and Jacob, or Jacob rigs, as we call them. Do you know all those vessels you see there are running on diesel? All of them. We're not talking about those that are on land operations. We're not talking about those that are on swan operation and those that are operating offshore. All of them are running on diesel. 
And many of them you see there at Marina or that where we call Lagos Lagoon, they are actually stacked. They don't have, they are not on contracts. They are just there waiting to be called upon for a contract or to bid. So that means they are likely to be idle like that for ages. Do you know that you must not sweep, the, the engines must not go up and they are running on diesel at the cost of about 700 naira per liter of diesel. Please, my people, or those watching me across the globe, tell me how those investors are going to break even. Let's just be very honest. Tell me how they are going to break even. Let me, that was why I said I will be as elementary as possible. As we're talking in Nigeria right now, right? Just look at that vulcanizer. Because, because I will talk to the issue, come to the issue of when people were saying we were subsidizing big men and whatever. Those were lies. Okay, just look at that vulcanizer. Well, a vulcanizer that will go and buy 10 liters of petrol at about 6,000 Nigerian naira. Tell me, please, how many tires that guy is going to fix before he breaks even? We're not talking about making profit. That woman, if truly the intention of government is to help the poor, that woman that has that pepper grinding machine, if she goes and buys petrol, 10 liter petrol at the rate of 6,000 naira, tell me how many pepper, how many customers she's going to serve before she breaks even. I mean, when you look at it from that angle, you will know that something is wrong. For all those who are saying remove subsidy, I knew they didn't know what was going on. Before subsidy was removed, a liter of diesel was around 87 Nigerian Naira. We were told that after the, the removal of subsidy, there was going to be competition, prices were going to come. I, but to me, I knew they, 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 were not, they, were not, they were not telling us the truth. But people felt, we are told, there will be competition. Prices will come down. So you should expect that the competition should beat down the prices to like probably 50 naira per liter, 60 naira. Per, as I speak to you, a liter of diesel is about 700 Nigerian naira. Where were the investors that we were promised? Where were the greenfield refineries that we were promised? Where are even the savings that we were promised? If you look at it, it's, 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 and I hear people, there is this dumb argument that, that if the price of, of fuel, or I mean crude oil, increases in the international market, we are supposed to be affected just because we buy from outside. But people have even forgotten the kind of arrangement that the government of Nigeria through NMPC had with offshore refineries. But in the first place, we are supposed to internally refine. And that is it. So but the surprising thing, when I even hear people saying, when the price of uh, crude oil goes up in Nigeria, we are supposed to, and I told that it was very clear. So many people are dumb. They, they, they don't have the, 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 the knowledge of the way the oil and gas industry works. And quote me that I said, the crude oil that you produce for internal consumption is completely different from the crude oil that you produce as a country or an oil producing nation, especially a member of that cartel called OPEC, that the crude oil you pump for, for as, as an allocation or quota to you for international market is completely different from the crude oil for internal consumption. OPEC has nothing to do with the crude oil for internal consumption. The crude oil that you send to the international market is being controlled by OPEC because you are a member of that cartel. And we know what a cartel is all about. But strange enough, you can't believe it. Oh, till late last year or around June last year, do you know that, could you, or could you believe that the person superintending over OPEC was a Nigerian, late Alhaji Sanusi Barkindo? Till that man left, and the, the guy, he was just about, I think, exiting. After probably like six or seven years, then mysteriously he died in Nigeria. Meanwhile, that guy was presiding over countries that, that, that saw the need to have functional refineries. But in Nigeria, we had nothing. It, I mean, what can be strange more than that? 
you know. So in the first place, we are supposed to refine internally. Then I hear people say, and there's another strange thing that Nigerians probably don't know. I've spent more than 30 years in the oil and gas industry, 30 years post-graduation. And I'm not a greenhorn in the oil industry. In fact, we just finished our Society of Petroleum Engineers conference. It was concluded yesterday at a co-hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. So I am updated till late yesterday, till the last 24 hours. I have an, a very good idea of what is happening on land location, swamp, I mean, uh, shallow waters, swamp location, and deep offshore. Till late last year, I mean, till the last 24 hours, I knew everything about the, the number of rigs that are actually operating in Nigeria. I knew so much about, I mean, the potentials of Nigeria in terms of crude oil and gas. And I'm talking about proved reserve. Like I said, I wouldn't want to discuss anything technical unless you prompt, prompt a question that will make me to go that. So I know everything. What me that I said, somehow, somewhere, I am telling you, there is a deliberate intention to make sure Nigeria does not produce crude oil that she will refine internally. There is a deliberate, a calculated, a well-syndicated and a well-crafted plan to make sure Nigerian refineries cannot refine. But unfortunately, people may argue but I can tell you that refining is basic chemistry. Anybody who tells you refining is more complicated than heart surgery or kidney transplant or cesarean operation, that person is not honest to you. Because we are dealing with refinery, we are dealing basically with what I call mechanical tools. I mean, you can fix them. But when you are dealing with, with human lives, you, you cannot. Just like the way Amana, we lost a medical doctor yesterday, towards the, the, the malfunctioning and, and obsolescence of, 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 of an elevator. You know, that smallest mistake, there was no blood. And she was, she, was a, she, was, she was a medical doctor in the mix of medical doctors, but they couldn't revive her. A refinery is not like that. You can re, revive it. And quote me that I said, everything about refinery involves the principle of boilers, distillation, fractionating towers, then all you need to have is to have sweeteners. So that if this is petrol, you put a sweetener so that you can differentiate what people call the smell or the odor or whatever. So the, anybody, again, who tells you that because crude oil is an international product, what is happening in Nigeria is happening either or happened in the Libya of Gaddafi, or is happening in Iraq, Iran, Norway, Malaysia, Indonesia, Qatar. That person is not honest to you. It's very, very unfortunate that lies were, were orchestrated, the lies were packaged. They were so packaged to the point where it's very clear that, I mean, what we are experiencing is deception. We got to a point, let me now talk about reasons for removal of subsidy. It's very, very unfortunate that I had people saying the reason why subsidy needed to go was because uh, we were subsidizing big men. We were subsidizing big men. And I, but I'm happy. It has been removed now, and people have seen it. Show me the big men that are regretting. Show me the big men that we have succeeded in punishing. And before the removal of subsidy on the only remaining product called petrol or PMS. People were saying we were subsidizing consumption and big men. And I asked them, I said, this, it was not correct. But, and I said, OK, if you say you want to punish the big man now, right, and you remove subsidy in the price of PMS, and the, the, that big man fires because he has so many cars to take care of madame, children, nanny, and megad and the rest, and he fires the driver, he fires the nanny, will government provide them jobs? If you, you can see it practically, you can see what's happening. I remember also some people said, because subsidy was removed, consumption has come down, and we have seen consumption that, that has come down, and it was because uh, there were all the subsidy tips have gone away. It's a lie. They, they, they are chameleons. They, are, they, are, they were chameleonic, and they have 
metamorphosed into something else. They have not been punished. The reason why you are not seeing cars now is because the disposable income of Nigerians ha ha have been eroded. That's what you are seeing. Go to the GDP variable. Look at the consumption index. The consumption index is down because disposable income has been eroded. Look at the investment index or variable, or, um, or, or, or variable of the GDP equation. If you can see it, there is no investment because even those you think are oil companies or investors are experiencing business climate hostilities. But apart from that, even if you go to what we call statement of income for, this guy, for, for investors, go. After what we call gross profit, you look at then what we call other expenses before you get to your profit before tax. One of the things eating and killing them is called cost of energy. They can break even. Quote me that I said in Nigeria today, strategic industrial sectors have collapsed. Strategic commercial sectors have collapsed. Strategic domestic sectors have collapsed. In fact, I just came back, like I said, we, we ended the conference for Society of Petroleum Engineers yesterday at, at a, a Eco Hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. I, there was this hotel I, I, I went to visit some of my, my, my former colleagues, uh, you know, and we went there. One of the hotels had, uh, I think, 138 rooms, but there were only about uh, 56 guests. And that hotel, was running the generator 24 hours on diesel. And I was made to understand that before they even came, the highest number of guests they were getting was like about 20 something guests. So whether they have one guest or 20 guests or 130 something, they must run the generator 24 hours. The same thing with hospitals. If you go to a hospital today, go and see. If it is a hospital that will have a 200 bed capacity, even if they are having just 30 patients, they must run the generator, generator all through. Tell me how they are going to break even. And it's the same thing with other areas. So my people, I just want to let you know that everything we were told was not correct. All those promises we were told were not correct. And check it again and see. You're talking about a country having 200 million citizens. Let's be fair, honestly. And permit me, and I, I'm not being vulgar, honestly. It, to me, it will not be immodest if I say some, not all, some of our economic and political leaders are morally bankrupt or are suffering from moral insolvency. If it is not moral insolvency, I would not expect to see what is happening. You're talking about a country of about 200 million citizens in addition to these strategic sectors, and you are relying on less than 10,000 megawatts of electricity. And somebody will come and tell me that the economy, you, you can bring your economy out of the woods. I mean, my, let, let's be honest to ourselves. I mean, many of us have traveled far and wide. Even if anybody has not traveled far and wide, look at what they have just said now. We were begging. We were literally begging and appealing. And we were telling, I mean, the new sheriff that was coming then that you have only one product remaining. And that was the only thing that Nigerians were hanging on. If you remove subsidy on that only product called PMS, everything will, will go down. They didn't believe it. They didn't, but we gave them practical examples. You remove subsidy in aviation fuel. When you remove the sub, uh, subsidy in the price of aviation fuel, what did we see? It was mass cancellation of flights, mass sack, and mass delays. We're only fortunate that we have not started experiencing crashes. You remove subsidy in the price of kerosene. You just succeeded in punishing all our parents in the villages because they don't have kerosene, nothing. And do you know one strange thing? It's only in Nigeria that I hear people talk. We just hear about transitions, transitions, and we follow. I get surprised when I even hear people saying, in 50 years' time, crude oil will become nothing. It will not have value. And, this is, and I feel sorry for Nigeria. As I speak to you till now, till this moment, some, some 
some uh, developed nations are still relying on coal, which is very, very toxic compared to crude oil. They are relying on coal to drive energy and drive their economy and generate power. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, we have been told we couldn't manage coal. We have so much coal. We were being told that we couldn't manage coal. We now went to something cleaner, less toxic compared to coal. We have now been told that we cannot manage crude oil. I hear people say, let's go to CNG, compressed natural gas. Let's go to auto gas. Let's go to. Oil. Meanwhile, petrol is a less flammable fuel. Diesel is a less flammable fuel. Petrol is a less flammable fuel. You cannot manage a less flammable fuel. People are telling you that you can go to, to, to something that is highly flammable. I just shook my head. And there was a time I heard that people were going to be, when they said we should go to compress natural gas or auto gas, they said all you need is to be given a kit. And once you have that kit, you can convert the engine of your car. Well, I said, if, if an Agbero at Obalende Mechanic Workshop or Transikulu Mechanic Workshop in Enugu or at uh, Panteka Mechanic Workshop in uh, Kaduna or in Kano or at Bulabuli in Maiduguri, if that guy can go and take a gasket from car A, I don't want to start mod calling models of car, car A, and cut it and twist it and make it a gasket in car B. Who told you as a nation you have the right to tamper with, 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 with automobiles of, of, of people? Have you forgotten that there is property and intellectual rights? This is a country you cannot even produce even the spoke of a bicycle, not to talk of a tire. And you are thinking, People, you can just go and tamper with intellectual property. Do you know that many of these futures, when you take car A, you have car A and car B, you have no right to pick the gasket of car A and put it in car B without taking permission. Because all these things are protected. So because Nigeria is such a lawless country where people can do these things, you think you can, as a government also, you can encourage your citizens to do that. Then my people, apart from just gas, I mean crude oil, you know there is this other special species of gas that we call condensate. Condensate is a special species of gas. I must be a bit technical here, such that if you hold the pressure constant and you allow the temperature to come down, that condensate, that gas will condense. That's where how they got the name condensate. It will condense and become liquid. And it's a very good uh, fuel. Do you know OPEC does not even tamper with that, does not even touch that. And that adds to the volume of endowment of Nigeria in terms of fossil fuel. Then look at natural gas. Everybody knows that Nigeria is even more of a gas nation than an oil nation. Our proved reserve, I don't need to explain it. Our proved reserve is more than 200 trillion cubic feet then our potential reserve is in excess of three, 600 trillion cubic feet. But as I speak to you, Nigeria is a member of another strong cartel called Gas Exporting Countries Forum. And you can't believe it. Everything about Russia is only gas. The strength of Russia is only gas. We have crude oil and we have gas. Russia is also a member of Gas Exporting Countries Forum. Is Nigeria as lead as Qatar? The answer is no. If from natural gas, you can get ammonia. I mean, I believe there are a lot of science people here. You can get ammonia. From ammonia, you will get urea. From urea, you will get uh, fertilizer. I can tell you that the fertilizer that used to cost about uh, probably uh, uh, 5,000 five years ago is more than 20,000 Nigerian Naira now. We cannot produce fertilizer. You cannot use your natural gas to drive gas turbines and generate electricity. So what can you tell somebody like me, Zaka? You cannot tell me anything. Look at the minimum wage. Is it not shameful that you are telling people that you have, you will remove subsidy and they were going to see palliative and we're telling you what you were trying to do is just like People were managing their lives and you, are, you came and insisted that you will create wound. You created wound in people 
and you are now running up and down to look for drugs. And we told you that that womb you want to create, that womb may become cancerous. People didn't believe it. And look at how they are running up and down. But you know it. That man, that, that vulcanizer, you told him you will help him, right? That vulcanizer, you remove subsidy now. He is buying six, um, uh, 10 liters at 6,000 Nigerian Naira. When will he break even? You have gone behind and you have made transport to be high. You have gone behind that vulcanizer, that his son or daughter that is in higher institution. You have increased the, the school fees. Are you, are you dealing with idiots or what? I mean, these things are, are, so, are, are so clear. And there was something at a point, I, I was in an argument and I told somebody, I said, people don't understand. If you are called a safety manager or a crisis manager and you are recruited, you are not expected to come and create crisis just to show people how sound or how intelligent you are. And if they call you a safety manager and they employ you, you don't need to come and create accidents so that you will show how intelligent you are as a safety manager. No, if they call you a crisis manager and you are boasting your work and you are employed, you are expected till the end, till you, when you will exit or retire, let there be no single crisis. Or if they call you a safety manager, when you come in, let there be no single incident. So, but if you come and you sit everywhere on confusion, then you don't qualify to be called a crisis manager or a safety manager. And my people, let's be very honest here. Look at this thing. You all know the minimum wage of Nigerians today. The minimum wage of Nigeria cannot buy a 50 kilogram bag of rice. Minimum wage, monthly, cannot buy a 50 liter jerry can of diesel. Expect anybody to tell you that our economy is in trouble? You don't need anybody to tell you that. It will take people who are taking like, citizens for a ride to ever think like that. But as far as I'm concerned, I think I, I had the opportunity of being well-trained, well well-exposed, especially in the oil and gas industry. And I talk, like I said, we just rounded up the oil and gas I mean, oil uh, international conference for society of petroleum engineers. I talk to people who work in the refineries. I talk to, to all the oil and gas engineers, oil and gas accountants, oil and gas lawyers, oil and gas technicians, environmental people. So I know what's going on. It's very, very unfortunate. It's just very, very unfortunate. Anybody who tells you that we cannot refine that person it, it does not wish us well. In fact, I had discussion with some international bodies, you know, creditor nations. Actually, they are creditors to Nigeria. And they were telling me that one of the reasons why they felt we, there is no need for us to, 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 to refine internally was that even if we refine, we were going to save like probably 10 naira per liter, especially on just PMS. And I said, oh, so there will even be savings. So in that case, we have been told that we save, I mean, we, we, we import about 50 million liters per day. So if we will be saving 10, 10 Naira on a liter, multiply the 10, 10 Naira by 70 million liters. That means every day we will save about 700 million Nigerian Naira. That was what I told the guy. I said that multiply the savings by one week multiply the savings by one month and multiply the savings by, by one year. It's a pity. You know, it's very elementary. I shot the guy down, but it was on technical argument. And I feel very, very sorry. Even our presidential candidates, all of them were saying, oh, they, 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 they will remove subsidy because they wanted to move from, oh, they were subsidizing consumption. Were subs and this is my answer to them, my people listening to me. And that was where they are getting it wrong. That, that to you, that crude oil, I mean, sorry, sorry, that petrol, you are giving that baba. To you, you are, you are subsidizing consumption. But to that baba, that petrol is what the catalyst he needs to carry out activities that will make him to achieve his end. So, 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 Mr. Zaka, 
Yes, what sir. exactly are you saying, uh, Bala, comrade? What, what exactly I are you saying? I want you to just marshal your points one by one by one by one. What okay. are you saying? Is subsidy, petrol subsidy we're talking about now, yes. is this an appropriate thing? And should we be having fuel subsidy? Or it is not appropriate? And what should we be doing? And so on and so forth. Just we, one by we, one by one okay. by one. Let me, let me hit the point by point. Yes. The first thing I want everybody to look at, look at this. When you look at fuel in the context of Nigeria, see it as an energy. Nobody drinks petrol. Nobody drinks aviation fuel. Nobody drinks kerosene or diesel. It is nobody drinks it. So we need subsidy in energy. As we speak now, we don't have energy. We cannot get electricity from the national grid. The only source of energy now will be through generators. And you have either diesel or petrol generator. So to that extent, we need it. And we are talking about energy security. Any country that does not have security will be at risk. And my own definition of risk is this. A risk is the chances of threat taking advantage of your vulnerabilities to cause you harm. And we have seen what is happening. We are experiencing economic harm. We are experiencing social harm. We are even experiencing political harm. So that must stay. Then another thing I want to say is this. It is the responsibility of government to provide goods and services for her citizens. Anybody that thinks because we have crude oil, and removing subsidy in crude oil is going to bring so-called, that person is not knowledgeable enough. Because the question you will simply ask that person is this, what if Nigeria was not having crude oil at all, at all? Are we going to go into slavery or what? So anybody that is telling you that, that removing subsidy in, in PMS is the way to generate revenue, that person is short-sighted. If government tells you like that, that government is short-sighted. I had also people, another thing I want to say in that direction is, anybody who tells you that the reason why Nigeria is doing well is because Nigeria is a monoproduct economy, tell that person that Balazaka says that person is not knowledgeable enough. And if that person is a government official, tell the person that I said, the person is deceptive. I'm saying this because if you go to Saudi Arabia, how many products do they have? Saudi Arabia is a monoproduct economy. It is the dexterity and creativity of the, the, the leaders that make Saudi Arabia to diversify. The same thing, if you go to everything about Middle East, Middle East was just a desert. They had only one product till today. So all those Nigerians you are seeing going to the Middle East, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Oman, and the rest, they have only one product. If you go to the Libya of Gaddafi, everything about the transformation was a monoproduct. So it is not the monolithic nature of the product that you have that makes you great, I mean poor. It is the creativity and the dexterity of your leaders. Okay, no problem. I have heard. Can you describe to us uh, in as um, easy terms as possible how the subsidy used to work when there was so-called subsidy? How did it work? What 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 are the transaction modalities that led to what people describe as well subsidy? Okay, first of all, let me give a practical example of how subsidy works. You see. As I speak to you right now, the price of bottled water is, is, is deregulated. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about economy restructuring mechanism. The price of, 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 of uh, uh, bottled water or drinking water is deregulated. It's deregulated, no control over it. But if you look at it, nobody is complaining. A bottle of water you will buy along the road or in traffic, you can go to a hotel or go to somewhere. That same bottle water or bottle of water, you can buy it at 500, 
1,000 or even 2,000. You, if you check, nobody is complaining. The reason is because there are substitutes. Any product that does not have substitute and you are an imagination, you are an imagined economy with a weak currency and you are an importing nation and you say you will deregulate the price of that product. I am telling you, you will create chaos. The reason why people are not complaining about the deregulation of the price of water, is there are different ways of getting pure water. I mean, drinking water. You can get it from the well. You can dig your own borehole. You can get it from, from the river and other areas. That's why people are not complaining. But in the case of petrol or diesel, you cannot put Ogogoro in the, in, 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 in the tank of your car. Can you, can you go and put uh, palm oil in the tank of your car? There is no substitute. It can only come from refineries and it can only come from government. And that's the reason. That's one of the reasons people, people don't understand. Then another thing, again, I keep telling people again is there is this dumb argument that, that is the worst. It is in Nigeria that I have noticed that people are saying you want to remove subsidy. Meanwhile, like I said, citizens are to government the way children are to parents. It is in Nigeria that I have noticed that they have just removed subsidy on energy. But let me give you also a practical example. The only reason why you have hospitals, public hospitals, whether teaching hospital, federal medical centers, and uh, health centers, is because government must, not should, government must provide subsidy in health. So whether the drugs are being stolen, cheap medical directors and the rest, are stealing the drugs. You cannot say you remove subsidy in health. Then let, let there be no hospital, public hospitals again. Then let, let people go to private hospitals. You cannot do that. The only reason why you have public, uni public universities, polytechnics, primary schools, and secondary schools is because government of a country must, not should, must provide subsidy in, in education. So whether vice chancellors, heads of department, deans and the rest are taking advantage and stealing, you cannot scrap public universities. In fact, the only reason why you have the military, custom, civil defense and the rest is because government of a country must provide subsidy in, in, in security. After all, it wasn't Nigerian army or the military that killed Shekau. So will you say because the commanders are stealing money, they are mismanaging the whole thing, then you will scrap everything and people provide private securities for themselves. That was what happened in terms of energy security for us. Just because some people, whether to government or where, we are stealing monies. And these people that, that, that are economic betrayers, instead of you to go after them, you say you will now scrap subsidy in, in, in energy. You don't do that. What you do is you go after the economic betrayers. You go after these people that wouldn't want your economy to grow. You go after those people that wouldn't want the subsidy to leave the government and get to the citizens. And there are, it's just very strange that, that technocrats got themselves engulfed and, and they were talking anyhow. And it is only in Nigeria you see a technocrat in the morning, he will say something else. In the afternoon, he will change. And in the evening, he will be chameleonic. I didn't say that technocrats don't make mistakes, but when you are a technocrat, stand on what you technically believe is the right thing. Whether you are a lawyer, whether you are an accountant, whether you are an engineer, whatever you are, that's what I expect. In the context of Nigeria, it is very clear. If technocrats refuse to stand up, I am telling you, the kind of docility we have in leadership, the kind of docility we have in creativity will make Nigeria one day to be reduced to a country of melancholies. And so with due respect to you, like I want to say, do you know that the last time Nigeria, uh, the, what do you call it? I mean, uh, uh, established a refinery was like in 1990 or 1989. You're talking about 34 years. The current generation of leaders didn't deem it necessary to even maintain the refineries they inherited, not to talk of constructing new ones. Do we need anybody to tell us that if we have been docile like that for 34 years, we will have energy crisis? 
Even when we went to democratic governance in 1999, you're talking about 24 years. How long will it take to construct a refinery? So anybody who supports this government, I mean, government generally, in this context, that person is, is, is not knowledgeable about the concept of subsidy. Because like I said, what if we didn't even have crude oil at all, at all? What will have happened? Does it mean Nigeria will cease to exist? So if we didn't have crude oil at all, like uh, countries like Togo, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and... Uh, 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 Kenya and all that. How do they, are, are their fuel subsidized also? Is their petrol subsidized in Kenya? Is petrol subsidized in Niger? Is it subsidized in Chad? Uh, how do they cope? If you go to countries that don't have, that's why they are in difficulties. They are in difficulties because they don't have. They all also have other things. But like now, recently I also presented a lecture for, 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 for some another group that had to do with African Union. And I gave them practical examples. Look at what is happening at the Democratic Republic of Congo. Look at the mineral endowment and look at the hardship. So it tells you that it is not your endowment, it's the creativity of, 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 of your leaders. I am sorry, I don't want to look as if I am religious. But for those that had the opportunity of being to Israel, tell me what Israel has in terms of natural gifts or endowment. Israel is a rocky, rocky, rocky enclave. Israel is rocky. There is nothing in Israel. The only thing you have in Israel is creativity. It's only creativity, nothing. It's okay, not so this, this, this subsidy, and uh, because right now, uh, maybe you can explain to me, uh, we get take out crude oil from the ground in Nigeria. Yes. We, we export that crude oil to different yes. countries, including the US, China, maybe India. Yes. Okay. And then some of the crude oil we take to Iran and places like that to refine for us. And then we import the crude oil. So by the time you get the crude oil out at uh, 47 or 50 or $100 a barrel, you take it to Iran, uh, shipment there, they refine it, they add on their own refining costs, they add on their shipment costs back to Nigeria. This crude oil now as petrol, value added is about $150 a barrel landed in Nigeria. It's so, a lie. No, 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 lie. no, 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 hold on. I'm not giving you exact figures. I'm okay, just sir. giving you uh, hypothetical figures. Okay, sir. Please listen to me very well. I'm trying to see where the subsidy is. Let's assume you take out a barrel of crude oil out of Nigeria at $100 a barrel. As you you add onto it shipping costs so the crude oil lands in europe at 105 or 110 dollars a barrel because they're shipping out of nigeria when it gets to the refinery in europe they are refining costs maybe that's 10 or another 20 dollars a barrel so it becomes 140 dollars a barrel you add onto it shipment back to Nigeria, it becomes $150 a barrel, landed in Nigeria in our petrol pumps, okay? And then where is the subsidy? How does the subsidy arise is what I'm asking you. Okay. You can use exact figures if you want, but no, I'll just I, hypothetical figures. No, no I, I, I won't use, ex I, I'm, I'm happy you said hypothetical figures. Just like, uh, like I said, in, 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 when you talk about statistics and uh, and mathematics. For me, I generally, I, I don't believe in statistics, but I use statistics. But I do believe I believe in mathematics because in mathematics, one plus one is two. But in statistics, one plus one is equals to X plus an error margin. That error margin can be 100% error. It can be 10% error. So that is what we are talking about. First of all, like you know, there is no reason for Nigeria to go, I mean, to export crude oil for refining. That is one. But secondly, 
assuming you even want to export, there is this understanding and agreement called direct supply and direct purchase. When you practice what you call direct supply and direct purchase, which I had a, we were made to understand that the Nigerian, uh, uh, the, the entity representing Nigeria, technically called NNPC, was, was, was practicing or was applying is, you agree right from day one, I will give you X quantity of crude oil. You will give me X quantity of distillates. Distillates technically means refined petroleum products. And remember, when you send crude oil out for refining, whether internally or anywhere, when you pass the crude oil and you start refining, that is why you have fractionating columns. After you distill it, it goes into a fractionating tower. That fractionating tower, at that point, there is what we call, technically we call temperature differential. At every temperature, cooking gas, at a particular temperature, cooking gas will come. Petrol will come. They all have their different temperatures at which they come out. But petrol is most of the time the, 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 the highest in quantity. So there is what we call yield. You will agree, you already know the yield of your product you, or, or your crude oil, because even the, the crude oil have different qualities. Like in the case of Nigerian crude oil, I think the petrol yield is, is, is close to 60% or even more. So you already know if I send this crude oil for, to you, diesel will come out of it. Bitumen will come out of it. Kerosene will come out of it. Aviation fuel will come out of it. Cooking gas will come out of it. You will agree on what should come back to you. So what gets a lot, of, that is why you see a lot of people are now challenging the government. I'm happy we are in democracy. That's why people are challenging. Okay, you send just for just the petrol. What happened to that component? Because it's like we talk about, you, yield, you call what we call yield. And that yield is like the percentage. So, okay. If 60% of what I sent you was just petrol, what about the, the, the diesel? What about the aviation fuel? What about the bitumen? And if we send this to you and you are only bringing petrol, remember, it is an agreed thing. I will send X volume to you and you will bring X, send back X volume to me of distillate. And in this case, the only thing we hear about it's just PMS. Nobody even tells us anything about kerosene. Nobody tells us anything about diesel. And in every barrel of crude oil, because barrel is the unit, like you said, sir, what happens to the crude or the, the, the diesel component of that one barrel? What happened to the, uh, the, the, the kerosene component of, of that crude oil, that one barrel? What happened to the Colta, as people say, or oh, bitumen component of that. If you look at it, nobody answers that question. And, and, and I just want to tell you, don't, I wouldn't want to be the mouthpiece of government and, or to talk for government. That is something we should take away, even if it is the only thing. Whenever you do this direct purchase, direct supply, and you are supposed to collect, we only hear of petrol, petrol. But we know that this thing, petrol has its own yield, which is the percent. The other component, what about the diesel? What about the kerosene? I think, sir, that is the way I will answer. Let them, first of all, tell us what has happened to those components. Because it's just an arrangement. The way they will incur expenses in sending to us the, the diesel is the way we are going to incur expenses in sending to them. So it will cancel out. It will cancel out. So anybody that tells you that we will incur insurance, we will incur this, we, you cannot say you will be, because it's direct purchase, direct supply. So, so you cannot, you, you will not be the one from Nigeria to pay for insurance, security, vessel, everything to that place. Then they will just be seated like that. They will not pay for any other thing. No, it's supposed to cancel out. You bring to me, I bring to you. But even if I'm going to take the cost of taking and bringing, you, are, you must increase the volume of what you are going to give me to equilibrate the whole thing or the business. 
I, I can tell you I know that answer, but let, let government should be the one to answer. And if government tells you something that is not correct, then I will tell you the correct answer. So to what extent is government subsidizing fuel? What percentage of the price is government taking? And how are they funding it? Because if you buy crude oil refined from a refinery in Paris or wherever, and they are selling you the petrol at $110, you forget about even a swap. Uh, what percentage of that $110 is government paying? And how is government funding it? Where is the money to pay for it? Where does it come from? Wait, first of all, let me let me let me point out something to, to you. Like I said, the production, the production for internal consumption belongs to the government. Is the is your food, you and your children. It's different from the quantity you send to the international market. So whether the price of petrol goes up. Whether the refining cost goes down is irrelevant. That quantity that you are supposed to use to take care of your citizens is not controlled by OPEC. And condensate is not controlled by OPEC. That is why you are not seeing this kind of thing in Libya now, in the days of Gaddafi. That's why it is not happening in Iraq now. That's why it's not happening in... Uh, uh, can I say something? Now. Come with, oh, yeah, but, see, see what yes, you um, I understand that, um, that, but you know in Nigeria of recent, we have not been meeting our quota. We have a lot of challenges in the um, in the south-south where this oil is being produced. So when you are talking yes. about that production is meant for our consumption, the truth is we are not even producing enough for that consumption. So this argument can be looked at the other way also because those guys are stealing the oil and then we are not producing enough because I get you. For instance, if we have 1.8 million quarter from OPEC, it is different from the 300,000 that we produce for internal consumption. That's what you are saying. But we are, not, we, are not able, you. we are not able to even produce the quantity we require both locally and for exports. Okay, let me answer you. And this thing gets, and this is where I, 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 when I said some of our leaders are morally bankrupt, this was what I meant exactly. You, if you go to some countries, they do not export a barrel of crude oil. Self-sufficiency first. Let me tell you, when you talk about the chain of crystallization, when you look at it, everybody knows that when you bring out a crude, whether it is a solid mineral or whatever, it is the refining and the processing is the byproduct that always comes up with everything. Even when you go to the farm and you bring out food and you process, it is, it is the processed ones that actually makes you to, to, to benefit and you gain from. But in the context of Nigeria, we prepare to sell the crude you prepare to go, you produce beans, but every time you need akara or moi moi, you will go to somebody who does not cultivate beans and you will buy moi moi and akara from that person. You think if the production or the frying and selling of akara or moi moi is not good, will that person be in that business? Another question again, just like the way I asked, I said, let, let pastor help us in asking them. If refining were to be a bad business, those countries that we go, and some of those countries, they don't even have crude oil, though, those countries that we go to buy these refined products from them, if refining were to be a bad business, are no. we saying that Comrade, we, Comrade as Zaka, we are more intelligent? Comrade Zaka. Yes, sir. I, th I, I think you should delink the two. We understand okay. that we have bad government that have refused to fix refinery and we cannot produce. Yes. I think what Pastor is asking really is, yes. help us see the subsidy element and how it works. And he narrated a very good example. If for okay. instance, we are producing that crude, let's say for the purposes of doing our calculation, the 300,000 we are supposed to calculate consume locally. Yes. We calculate it at the international price. We add the transportation cost to Sweden, whatever. Just look at it like that. 
and then it gets to Sweden, they, they refine it at a cost to us. It comes back to Nigeria at what cost? So where exactly? So just you know, answer the question so that people can understand okay, okay, where me, the subsidy me, comes from. No, first of all, first of all, let me tell you, let me tell you the fact that the crude oil, mm. the crude oil is internal, is personal to your government and you. Yeah. It yeah. already tells you you are enjoying subsidy from your government. No, no, but we, there's a cost of producing it now. There's a cost of bringing it out. Now, but the cost of production is the same now. There is cost of production in, in Saudi Arabia now. There is cost of production in Libya now. There is cost so, of production. So, 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 so add, Zaka, add the cost of production Zaka, Zaka, and do everything Zaka, for us. Take me through it. Eh? The 300,000 <laughs> barrels yes. that Tony has said is for local consumption that you have yes. said for local consumption. How much does it cost? to turn that 300,000 bar barrels to petrol? How much does it cost the Nigerian government to turn that 300,000 barrels to petrol? And how much should that petrol be sold for? And how much is it being sold for? That's the question I'm asking you. Okay, the, first, the, the answer I will just tell you is, the only person that will give you that cost is the government because I, I'm not a part of the government. So it will, I will not give you something that I don't know. I will not. It's the government. The government has said they went and converted it to this, to that, to that. That, that was why. Maybe the, the other brother didn't get what I was trying to say. I, first of all, I, 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 I well, the, the, the refiner they had the uh, understanding with, I don't know, first of all, which country's refiner. I don't know the distance from that country to Nigeria. I don't know the bilateral agreement between that country and Nigeria. But I know, I know, one thing I know for sure is this. Outside the production cost, which also varies per, per barrel here, outside the production cost, one way or the other, you don't carry your crude oil. Ask in any country, you don't carry your crude oil and say, I will take it, export it, treat it for me, and I'll bring it back. If that was what was happening, I would have told you that we will have been receiving uh, diesel coming uh, together as part of the distillate, we will have been receiving petrol, part of that 300,000 barrel, and other components. But that's not what we receive. They only talk about petrol. And if you will ask me which of the refineries, is it the refinery in France? I don't know the refinery. Is it the refinery in Rotterdam? Is it the refinery in Russia? So the biggest mistake I will do with my also knowledge, and as somebody who talks to Nigerians that are working in offshore refineries, the biggest mistake I will do is to give you a cost that I don't know. First of all, I don't know the refinery. But what uh -huh. I want to let's tell you, technically, if, if from what the other brother was saying, okay, we carry our own crude, we transport it, they refine it for us. Then that is, I can tell you that we will have been having vessels going that way. And as the vessels are coming, they will have been coming with our refined uh, diesel. They will have been coming with our refined petrol. They will have been coming with our, our, our bitumen and other products. But that's not what okay. is happening. Okay, we're, we're, getting, we're getting warm now. So what I get from you, comrade, is that the first thing we should do is even to ask our government to account, to account for this so-called crude that they are swapping for petrol. That's number one. Exactly. Because there's no proper accounting. If you, a person who's been in the oil industry for this long, does not know how much the government is it is costing us we should because you know you've just reinforced my belief that this whole thing might just be a big scam that in the first place you don't even have any proper accounting we don't even know how much we don't know how much the oil is costing the second thing is that even out of that crude oil based on your fractionalization principle exactly. Nobody exactly. has accounted for the bitumen. They have not accounted for the gas. They've not Nothing. accounted for the kerosene. Nothing. Nothing. So it is possible that some people are carrying this crude away uh, and not giving us the proper value for whatever they've even carried away 
and they are making money in international refineries on our on our crude. They are selling the bitumen. They are selling the gas. They are selling the this thing, and nobody knows anything about it. In fact, so let, you have just reminded me on something. Before it escaped my memory, let me let me let me let me say, tell it to Nigerians or viewers across the globe. You know, sir. And all, all these things, you know, we have been made to feel that we don't even know how much we produce, that we don't even know. And quote me, I am telling you today, apart from what we call seepage losses, apart from what we call fractions of evaporation, you understand, we know the exact quantity of petrol, I mean, crude oil we produce, and everything. And let me tell you this. When you get the crude oil from the reservoir, in the reservoir, it is a mixture of crude oil, water, and sand. And when they come from the reservoir, they come to a collection of valves that we technically call wellheads. But the practical name in the industry is called Christmas tree. That Christmas tree is a set of valves. When the crude oil comes to the Christmas tree or the wellhead, the first place the, well, the, the crude oil gets directed to, that's where you have the first set of pipelines. They get to what we call a separator or a flow station. That's where you see that flaring taking place uh, in, around the oil fields or oil communities across the globe. It goes to what they call a flow station. When it gets to the flow station, at the flow station, what you have is you have what we call separators. So it is there that separators will separate. You know, like I told you, in the reservoir, it is water, sand, and gas. So at the separator, it will be separated into crude oil. You will have the quantity of sand. You will have the quantity of gas. And they can tell you the percentage of the crude oil. They can tell you the percentage of that, that volume that was sand and gas. So it is that gas that is actually being flared. That is the gas. So every time you see that thing being flared, it's not that they are burning the gas ordinary that we should have used, no. But it is that gas that came, the, the one that came from the reservoir that is not needed. And they will also show you the quantity of sand. So at that point, we all know the quantity. And quote me that I said, we use pressure monitoring devices to know all the quantities that get to the wellhead. You will know all the quantities that get to the separator. It is after the separator on their way to export terminals, it is those ones that get attacked by criminals. Because I want to make these things clear. That was why I said I won't be, I won't be, I will be down, down. So when you hear they also talk about pipeline vandalism or uh, stealing crude oil, it is not the crude oil that came out from the, from the reservoir directly. No, it is that one that came out because the flow stations are always not too far from the wellheads. When you have, you always have a flow station, maybe when you, then you now have up to probably 100 wells around that, when you have up to like 50 or 100 wells, then you put a flow station there. So flow station is technically a collection point to separate the crude oil coming there into or the production. Let me call it production because crude oil is just a component at that point. Sand is a component. Water is a component. So that one, then the, after that, then it will now start going to the export terminals. Because in Nigeria, we don't have a midstream. Had it been we have a midstream, then the pipelines from that, from the first stations to the refinery, that activity is what we call midstream. But in our own case, from there, it goes to export terminals. And some of you know, I don't want to start calling companies and mentioning their export terminals. So it is those ones that go to that export terminal because the export terminals are very far. A company can have uh, 30 different uh, locations, but they may have only one export terminal. But also they can have an agreement. Company X can key into company B's export terminal. They know how they do the calculation and know the ratio of their quantity of crude oil or whatever. But what I want to tell you, we know the quantity. 
But you know, in Nigeria, Nigerian brain has been so rubbish to the point where we think we don't know. Go to anywhere, go to Saudi Aramco, call anybody. There are many Nigerians working in Saudi Aramco. Reverend, after now, I can give you the names of Nigerians. Call them. They, they monitor every drop of crude oil. They monitor every drop of water. They monitor every drop of sand. The only thing that can go wrong is if you have pipe integrity issues. Because there is something we call pressure. Just like human body, if your pressure drops, the thing triggers, everybody will know. If your pressure goes up, everybody will know. It is the same thing. In fact, let me tell you, I don't want to go into a field. In petroleum engineering, we were told that those who develop the principle of pipelines were medical doctors. Because there is a cause we call fluid flow in conduits. Conduits are pipes. It is the principle of veins and arteries that was used to convey crude oil. And let me tell you, there is what we call flow station and pumping station. It is the equivalent of the heart. So once you leave that flow station also, you have special pumps. They are those that pump and export to the, take them to the export terminal. So it's the, it's the principle of blood circulation. Ask anybody who read petroleum engineering or who has taught the history of pipeline movement. I'm not digressing, but I just want to let you know. But at the point, you know, many people think we don't know the quantity. So it's even not fair on that government entity that doesn't want Nigerians to know because everybody that comes and operates in Nigeria, you are a, a tenant of Nigerian government. Nigeria is the host country. Even if you have a joint venture relationship or you are operating what we call production sharing, you are on your own. You must account for the crude oil, sand, and gas that come out from everywhere. But because of all the boju boju, as I speak to you, even you hear even uh, people at the uh, motor parks saying even the crude oil we, we produce, we don't know the quantity, which everybody knows. Okay, so why has governments then, maybe I don't even need you to answer that question, but why do they keep giving us the impression that people do not know uh, that we produce this amount of crude oil, then what gets to the export terminal is this amount. So in between, some people have stolen the, the, the crude oil, and we need to be able to even know the people who've sto stolen them. There's organized stealing, there is a banditry, and so on and so forth. But people refuse to give us this account and nobody is asking, why is that so? Why that, are people like you not asking questions and holding government accountable and telling them you. to stop telling us all these things? Thank you. Let me answer that before I saw somebody raising his hand. Let me tell you, for this one, permit me to say, to mention the name. I think it was in the days of... Uh, uh, Okonjo Iwela also. I remember that time they said Nigeria was losing because I want to say that you said whether some of us are actually asking. We ask, but people like me, I don't ask them directly, but I come up with analysis to show that they are not honest. Uh, oh, sorry, not that they are not honest, but they need to be more open and help Nigerians. I remember there was a time they said Nigeria was losing, I think during the time of Okonjo, where they said Nigeria was losing about 400,000 barrels of crude oil per day. And they were blaming petty thieves and criminals. And so let me, if anybody has a calculator, let us do a little bit of math. The unit of crude oil is called barrel. In a barrel, you have 42 gallons. In a gallon, you have four liters. So when government said during the time of our Mrs. Okonjo Iwela, also they said we were losing about 400,000 barrels per day. I just told, that was what I, what I did. I said, take that 400,000, multiply it by 42 to give you the volume in gallons. It will give you about 16 point something million gallons. Multiply that 16 point something million gallons by four to convert it to liters, it will give you about 60 something million liters. 64, 64 million Thank liters. You. 
So 64 million liters. Then you know that an average tanker of petrol or diesel is 30, 32, uh, uh, 33,000 liters. Am I correct? You know, a yeah. tanker is 33,000. Then I said, divide that 60 something million, million. liters by 33,000. It will give you about 2,000. And that was when I told Nigerians, I said, when people were hearing these 400,000 um, barrels, you will think it's some buckets. But sir, divide that, that will, you will get about 2,000 tankers. And I said, if it was the government that said we were losing about 400,000 liters per day, that 400,000 liters is equivalent to 2,000 tankers of 33,000 liters each. And I concluded, I said, to me, that could not have been, or that thing was, that was happening couldn't have been petitives. No way. Because it's just like saying, every day, 2,000 tankers, 2,000 tankers. Are going. There is no economy that will, that will not collapse. There is no investor that will not run away. But the truth is this. If that was truly what was happening, then it was a well-crafted, a well-syndicated, and a well-coordinated Criminality beyond petty tips, beyond all those guys so, we think. I have only one more question for you, and I need to take questions from the floor. And we've even gone way past our time because of your passion. Sorry, uh, we have only Sorry, been able to people. talk about uh, the oil subsidy, but you still have not satisfied me. I want no to problem. know how much this subsidy is and how this subsidy arose. Do you have any figures for me? How much are we, how much is the government subsidizing this so-called, this thing? Because uh, there's so many uh, questions okay. to ask. Uh, so let me just say something quickly before we answer the others. Okay, why are you call a parent? Okay, you have a restaurant, you can prepare food, in your restaurant to go and sell outside. And you cannot feed your children. How can your children grow? Government must provide something. Now. Why are they called government? Provide energy. Provide means of livelihood. You don't provide mm -hmm. diesel. You don't provide kerosene. You don't provide uh, drugs at affordable rate. What kind of human capital, what kind of citizens do you want to produce? What we citizens or the government is to be civic in our behavior. Then we also need to comply with the civic responsibility of paying our taxes and levies. And one thing about government, that is why I said government is different from private sector. For government, whether you like them or not, whether in the community there are mad people, armed robbers, prostitutes, yeah, we are, you must construct roads to pass through. You must construct hospitals. You must provide. That is why you are called government. Whether you go to South Africa, you go to Iran, Iraq, US, you must if you don't provide for your citizens, then who should you who should provide? Why are you called government? That was why I said you were elected and they handed over their economic, political, and social destiny into your hand. Somebody is staying in Aso Rock, enjoying, and you are paying him billions. Didn't you put him there to think? Why is it called government then? Why? Okay, you, why is somebody even called a parent? If, if your children do not deserve to be fed by you, it is when they get to a particular level now that they will begin to provide for you. That's why they, they get to a particular But even when they get some, will still be irresponsible children. That's why we are. So for us, you have corporate citizens and individual citizens. Like all of us know, corporate citizens are the companies. If you don't provide, like we are talking about the cost of diesel now, you don't provide, you don't minimize it. How do you expect them to break even and pay taxes? What they owe you is to behave in a civic manner as corporate organization and to, and to also be, provide corporate social uh, responsibilities to communities. But they owe you civic responsibilities of taxes and levies. But you must develop them to a particular level. You didn't train your children to become graduate and, and uh, vocation and things like that. How do you expect them to perform? 
then why does government even exist? Why? Okay. Why do you parents still exist? Answered answered my question, but I'll let you off. Uh, if I'm with you, you want to ask a question? If I'm with you. Or mute yourself, go straight to the question. If he's not ready, please allow him to unmute. You know, we really want to know the cost of this subsidy and how much this subsidy is costing. I really want you to give me a figure. Telling you is this, I don't know where, the, first of all, the crude oil, you produce it as a government now. It's different from the one you sell on the international market. You want you to you will refine and provide to your people, but I don't know the refineries they go to. I don't know the agreements they have with the refineries. I can't quote figures that I don't know. Can I tell me, sir? Okay, Nee, go ahead. Ask your question. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yeah, Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm going to talk about two things. One is the um, production. Um, that's the production from the refinery and also the um, subsidy. In the case of the refinery, I'm looking at it from one point of view, that okay. why is our refinery not working? Like you said, the extraction from day one, the extraction of the crude oil has always been working. And it costs a lot to even maintain extraction processes. Yes. The, the, the process breakdown, it has defaults, but it can maintain that and always extract. Sure. Why is it that the production end is the one that you cannot maintain? I say it is a form of conspiracy in this, because when you extract and you export, it pays some interest easily, rather than to produce it here. That's my own thought, I may be wrong. Secondly, mm -hmm. from the export of these products, what I see the government doing is that they are just exporting raw products. They don't mind the bringing back of this raw product as they really say. So all they are concerned is that what is the export price? And once they get that, they now give import license to individuals here to bring in finished products in different forms. So what they do when they bring in finished products from diff in different forms, they have a, 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 a price that they want to sell to the masses. And the differential between that price and the cost of purchase internationally, that where they put the subsidy, using the money of export to float the subsidy. But okay. along the line, along the line, it started gradually and they could manage it. And people now discover that it's even easier for me to get an import license for, um, for uh, any of the petroleum products, either petrol, uh, diesel, or gas. And by the time I import, I just want to tender my paper and get subsidy. Because what they do is that they give subsidy at the point of importation. So after importing, you bring your papers back to them and they calculate the subsidy. So, so most of the time, when you are in the um, fuel depot, what you see is that Sometimes the, the owner of the depot may even prefer to even sell below 194 or 182, which is depot price. Because all his concern is that by the time he takes his paper back, he has gotten all his um, um the all the subsidy, which is much more profitable for him. But along the line, also, a lot of people that are not even importing directly, they are just throwing up papers to get subsidy. And whereas also because of the price differential and the arbitrage on the West African subregion and even up to Sudan, why would they be routing in Sudan and the rest? Because we, we decide to close up our, uh, our subsidy. It's because our fuel gets, the one they import to Nigeria gets as far as other West African neighbors and they can also arbitrage on that level. So it's like you said, on the 4,400 4, uh, barrel per day, there's a lot of money being sunk by individuals. There's a lot of conspiracy, a lot of people involved, the, from the immigration customs and everybody, they are all involved. So if we can checkmate all that and we can close our border, I think, and we can even use the same way that we, the, if, if, if Chevron and the rest that are operating our uh, drillers, if they can do that successfully, why can't we just um, fashion out our 
refinery to them. Let, let, let us let us factor factor it out to them. Let them produce, and we take from them directly. This shipment cost to and fro will be out of it. This production cost over there will be out of it. So everything will be local. We can now calculate what is the price per liter in Nigeria. Thank you. Yeah. Can I answer that question quickly? Can I say one or two things? Let me tell you quickly. Like you were saying, the reason why you don't see the level of corruption at the production of the crude oil is because that part is very technical. There is nothing to eat. You can't eat the, the raw crude oil. I'm in the upstream. So in the upstream is very, very technical because what we are after is to get to the reservoir, spend so much. To drill a well, you can spend sometimes $10 million, some $20 million, some less, and the rest. There are some that are even $50 million. And sometimes you can drill a well at the end of everything, you will just meet what we call ordinary water, which we call wet sand. And you will lose. So it's a very risky business. But when you go to the downstream, you are dealing with products that people can sell. And it's very easy to control. But let me tell you, this point you made, because sometimes people mm. like, because of the passion, I can't remember. It, at the rate things are going, even Dangote will crash. Let me tell you, because I of that, you said, I my got daughter's um, prescription. She dropped it in the afternoon. Okay, sorry. In sorry. the afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Even, yeah. Even, um, even, even, even. Please, that person should mute their microphones, please. And please continue. Okay, mute you. I've muted myself. That even Dangote will not survive. I told some people they didn't believe it. Because if you look at it for Dangote, I sympathize with Dangote because if you look at the cost of the land, the cost of the clearing, the cost of compensation, even the cost of the structure that Dangote has there, it's not easy. It will take time for Dangote to, to break even or to reach his payback period because he must have gotten the money from either creditors or shareholders. And if it is from shareholders, he must give them dividends. If it is from uh, creditors, he must pay cost of debt. But do you know what will happen? At the rate they are continuing with, if they, if they really meant well for Nigeria, they can't be issuing import license. And if they continue to issue import license, even with Dangote and the Nigerian refineries, do you know what people will do to finish Dangote? All they need, you know, all they need is that import license. You didn't invest in office. You didn't invest in any structure, nothing. You will just order or tell your friends overseas or offshore. They will just send these refined petroleum products to you. All you need to do is to technically reduce it by five, five naira below downgote. That's what people will do. If you bring 10 million liters and you make it five, five naira lower than downgote, that five, five naira differential multiplied by 10 million, in less than one year, Dangote will crash. It, it, people don't know how negatively smart Nigerians are. Th th that is what will okay. happen to Dangote. People don't know. So okay. long as they continue to give import license, it will also is a pointer that they wouldn't want our refineries to work. And even if Dangote refineries start working, importers can never bring fuel and make it more uh, more expensive than Dangote. They will just create a, a, a difference of like mm -hmm. two, two naira or 10, 10 naira. And they will be raking in millions. It will just be a question of time. Dangote will fade and die a natural death. Or Dangote refinery, pardon my, my phrase. Okay, okay. All right, no problem. Can we take two more questions from Mr. Bolahon Olojeje? and Afolabi Ajidan. Then after those two questions, please you respond to them. Go along. Okay, sir. Th thank you very much, sir. Um, thank you, my brother, Zaka. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I just thought I should pitch in on a couple of uh, things that he has said. Um, no, no, number one, uh, from the chat that I read, it seems as if uh, maybe what he said, um, that there are people who are interpreting that to mean that there is no fuel subsidy. Um, is. There is there is fuel subsidy. Um, then the issue of a swap swap was not defined is designed by Nigerians. It's a, it's an international product. So um, 
swap can be fair and it can not be fair at the same time. It depends on the operators of the swap. Crude oil has value. Refined product has value. What swap is simply doing is exchanging value for value, and those value can be determined. So swap in itself is a neutral product and is a good product. But if people who are involved in swap are fraudulent, then they can begin to play games around swap. Then generally on subsidy matters, subsidy generally is not a bad thing, and we shouldn't demonize subsidy. However, subsidy is most efficient when it is targeted, which means it is not everybody that needs certain level of subsidy. So the question, the, the, where the mental laziness comes in is when we have a subsidy scheme and we decide to, you know, target it to everybody, including those who don't need it. Subsidy should be targeted, but it requires a lot of work to determine who are the people who need subsidy and how should they be targeted. What we have in Nigeria is a subsidy that is not targeted at anybody, but given to everybody. So whether it is in education, in electricity, in everything, we just believe let's give subsidy to everybody. I was with a client of mine this morning at Magodo. Uh, where he lives in Magodo, they have electricity where they pay a premium price for electricity. And uh, he showed me his generator, a 60 kVA generator. He has not put on that generator for more than six months. Why? Because he has constant supply of electricity. And I'm bothered to ask him, I said, okay, this is your premium amount that you are paying. Is it not too expensive for you relative to, uh, you know, generator? And he said, no, that it's actually much cheaper and better for him to run on electricity, run on uh, uh, PHCN than to run on those generators. So I asked myself, generally, that look, what the, what the Baba, because I remember Zaka used the example of a Baba. What the Baba wants, it's not cheap fuel to put in a generator. What the Baba wants is electricity. And it is important to get to the root of that matter and define correctly what the Baba wants. And it is electricity in this case. It is also the same thing with most of the other things that we use PMS for. Exactly. People want an efficient transportation system, not cheap fuel. It is not e cheap fuel. E e sir, sorry, I for you know I, I've been on. I, I came from a conference, so I forgot to. I, I connected my laptop. I didn't know that I didn't even on the light, so I'm using my phone now. Sir, that thing you are saying is hundred percent correct. I, can you people hear me? Yes, 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 yes clearly. That was yes, what I kept telling the government that if you provide electricity, there will be glut at the filling station. The reason why we need we need energy, but the reason why you see people scrambling for this petrol, petrol, that was what I still kept. I said we don't drink this petrol, we don't drink this diesel. Many of these people, it's because there is no electricity from the national grid. If you bring, if we have electricity, in fact, you, some people, like many people don't go out these days. People stay in their houses right from COVID. They have office, everything. But it is because they cannot, there is no electricity from the national grid. They will go and buy petrol. They will need generators. And the generators will only be either petrol generators or diesel generator. So you are 100% correct. This petrol, people don't drink it. The vulcanizer does not drink it. The barber does not drink it. The hairdresser does not drink it. The hospital, the banks, they don't drink the diesel. But it is because there is no uh, electricity from the national grid. And if you look at it, all of you know, I mean, in 2019, somebody was appointed from Mambila to revive electricity. And you know, strange enough, that minister was from that axis. That guy ate the whole money. It is only in Nigeria that 
the chief accountant of a federation, the chief accountant of a country will work the whole money and nothing happens. Honestly, sir, Nigeria, my people, let us reason together. Something is wrong with the governance in Nigeria. Okay, Afolabi Ajidan, please ask your question very quickly. And Femi Olowe, ask your questions. And then, comrade, you can take all those questions together. Yes, yes sir. Um, we have four refineries not working. Yes, they are still having employees. And the national budget for salaries is about 1.2 billion for employees of the four refineries. Where is the money coming from to pay these workers? And then are you in view, are you in support of the refineries? Because there must be a reason why these refineries cannot work or are not working. Are you in support of the refineries being sold off to the private sector? You know, and uh, finally, I want to ask you, to be honest and truthful, since you said let's be honest and truthful with ourselves, the current price per liter of petrol at 617 naira or whatever it is, it's, uh, it's not sustainable. It is not sustainable. If we want to be really, really and truthfully honest with ourselves, petrol is going to go up to around 800, 800 naira plus per liter. What do labor intend on doing? Okay. Thank you. Are you done, sir? Yes, thank let you. Me, let me start with the, with the 800 naira <clears throat> per, per liter. Just, okay, you want, you are living in a country where petrol will go to 800 naira per liter. How much is your minimum wage? I have never been in support of increasing salaries. I have never been. What they have done, you see, mistakenly again, the government, you are not producing anything. You devaluated your currency. If I had known, I would have talked about currency devaluation currency depreciation and currency redenomination. You don't do that. You must control your, you can only be a, a producing country to devaluate your currency so that you attract markets. But you sat down on your own because depreciation is you left your currency to the forces of demand and supply to competition. But if it is devaluation, you deliberately on your own as a government took step and reduced the value of your currency. So be fair, let us be fair. At 800 Naira per litre, right? Look at the minimum wage, 30,000 Nigerian Naira. That means how much, how much petrol will somebody buy to spend 30,000 Nigerian Naira? You are talking about probably just slightly above 25 liters. Does that make sense? Who will buy, who will break even? And that is where we are saying, why do you even have government? If at the end of the day, you don't want your countries, uh, your citizens to, 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 to break even. Then on the issue of selling the refineries, let us, let, let, let's look at it. Anybody that has the intention of going into the business of refining should go and develop his own. Why must they wait for government own to be sold to them? Instead of uh, deregulating the sector, why not liberalize it? And this is where we have also another confusion. A lot of people will be saying uh, telecoms was deregulated. It did. No, it was liberalized. And that was why I said some people don't know the difference between liberalization. And that's why I feel bad about our government. They are confusing people. people many people don't know the difference between deregulation and liberalization. Some don't know the difference between commercialization and privatization. What happened in the case of the telecom sector was liberalization. In liberalization, you still control the price and quality. Let the volume and quality of supply bring customers to people in that case. And that was why in liberalization, uh, Nitel was left to still stand. But Econet, MTN, and the others, Glow, were allowed to come in. And Nitel died a natural death. That's why you can never see Nitel staff protesting. So in the case of Nigeria, also the refineries, if you liberalize it, 
allow the Nigerian refineries to exist, then control the price, allow players to come in. Anybody who tells you that because you control the price, they cannot make profit is also lying to you. Allow them to come in based on the quality of their service. Let them get customers and if the, if the can you hear me yeah yes. sorry like i said a call wanted to come in but my phone when i came i forgot to connect my phone the battery went off and uh, the, the the laptop went off sorry about that so i'm using my phone Okay. I can see here you, sir. Okay. You want me to go ahead ahead and uh, uh, see what I have? Yes, sir. Right. Okay, so uh, for me, um, I would say that one of the reasons why the topic the, the, the sound of or may not be acceptable, especially for the fashion of uh, in this part of the world, the quick side. Uh, you know, quickly we take side based on our interest because we are more individual minded versus effective minded. I haven't said that. I haven't said that. No matter how, no matter the nomenclature we give to it, there will stop it. I tell you, how does this At the point, I was in a PC. Yeah. Okay. So, how does this uh, work out in IG? NMPC has a store right of importation today, even yesterday, even yesterday, yes. And this is what the NMP's managing director claims. Except a few uh, days or a week ago where they said they have issued blind sales to others to bring in for it. So which means on the IC, whether you give license to someone or, or not, by the time it gets to the shores of Nigeria, it becomes NMPC um, oil, whether petrol or whatever. So if we don't know the uh, millions of liters we consume per day as against our former uh, I can't remember her name now that she claimed then because we, uh, initially they said it was 40 million later on when they did all the fact finding and co the the uh, Wiki, they said it was 20 million liters we consume a day. So if you bring well, we don't today, NMPC does not tell us what is the landing cost, what is the landing cost to the PMT, and after buying it, what is the landing cost to what is the transportation from MM, uh, from BPMC to each uh, filling station. So and yet we are saying at 140 naira, 189 naira, 190 naira. And then all of a sudden, the government came in and said uh, there has been subsidy and that they are going to remove subsidy. We, I, as a person, will expect NMPC or the government to come out and say that this is the cost, the arrival at PPMC. And this is how much it will take each liter of oil to get to any filling station. And based on this calculation, this is what to be the actual that we should buy it. All of a sudden, subsidy was removed and the price went from 189 naira, 190 naira to 500 naira. So how do you want to tell me that government has been subsidizing 200 naira a liter? So does it mean that as So which means 500 naira minus one, minus 190, the government was paying 310. 
That's why I'm telling us that, and I agree with Comrade Zaka. There was nothing, nothing was a scam. There was nothing like that up to now. And then why are we coming up with, ah, they started stealing uh, the crude oil. We are losing so-so amount. We were uh, down on OPEC uh, um, contribution, so-so and so. These were coming out because some people started, you know, poking and giving some information to the Nigerian people. I want to say, I, I, I close it, that honestly, for Nigeria and this part of Africa to move on, we need to have collective mind, ask questions, not taking side, not supporting anybody, ask the right questions, and not allowing the education that we have, the so-called education that we have to, 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 to derail us from asking the right questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I can answer, sir. Uh, uh, kindly hold on. Let Mr. Noyo also ask his question. Then we can take both of them together, sir. Okay, sir. Mrs. Noyo, evangelist Mrs. Noyo Aden. Good afternoon, all. Apologies, sir, Mrs. Noyo. No, that's okay. Good afternoon, all. Uh, from uh, your presentation, what you have told us so far, the information, and which one we already know about it. There's a total lack of transparency in the way the NMP yes. does business and the oil sector generally in Nigeria. And what is coming to my mind right now is that I don't think Nigerians, I, I feel that even the government probably doesn't know uh, what is happening with the oil sector. The refineries were built by uh, foreigners, they helped us, and whatever uh, pipe. Uh, they have whatever they have underneath the ocean to take this oil to various other countries. They did it. I'm not sure that we truly know how many countries we are supplying oil to without, <laughs> and they are getting it very free. I'm saying this because about seven or eight years ago, in one of the places where I worked, uh, there was a lady from the, the Philippines who told me that she has a lot of people working in Nigeria. And they told her that we have the purest oil in the world, that you don't have to refine it. And that people just come there and they take oil out of Nigeria. She was telling me uh, in, in the office, I said, true. I said, yes, that we have a lot from my country there. That they just lift your oil. They don't even have to refine it. So that's one thing. And what I learned from your presentation, uh, Mr. Zachary, is that you told us about subsidy in the area of education, like uh, 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 Wolowo did. And there are other places where the government can actually subsidize. Sub 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 I, I in, uh, uh, those other sectors of the economy to help us so that people will enjoy their lives. So I think there's a need to educate our leaders, uh, let them know that there are other ways that they can help Nigerians because Nigerians are really suffering. And as someone said, the last speaker, that we, we demand to ask our leaders more questions. And I heard uh, one of the coordinators telling you that you worked in the uh, oil uh, uh, sector and then uh, you, there were some questions that you did not have answers to because you did not know. So a lot of people did not know. And then uh, this is really, uh, I would say it's really terrible, shameful, and we need to, to not you, but all of us, even our leaders who are just they in, in, very ignorant of the things that have happened. I just feel that well, our oil sector is maybe still being controlled by our colonial masters. A lot of things done that we do not know about. So we truly need to find out uh, the answers so that we can help ourselves and help our people. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think that will be the last question. So uh, comrade, please answer that question. Okay. And then I'll ask uh, Minister Sonny and Jimoke if they have any comments and yes. they can yes. take it on from there and uh, close the meeting. Yeah, <clears throat> thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, uh the truth is there is lack of transparency there is lack of tra transparency ma you are you are 100 correct but i don't where you say government doesn't know that one is is not uh correct government knows i mean uh, what you, uh, I, there are certain i'm a chairman now of a professional body i was sworn in uh on the 31st of uh of 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 may 
Uh, I'm at, uh, well, let, let me just say that I'm, I'm the chairman of the Keja and District Society of ICANN right now as I speak to you. Uh, Ma, immediately I came in as the chairman. There is nothing that will be hidden again. I will know everything. The, the only thing is those who were there before I came, were there my pallies? It was it a pali pali? How did I become a chairman? Was it uh, I was were there manipulation so that I can see and 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 just be helping others to survive? If there is any corruption, the first thing when before I took over, everything was given to me on a sheet of all the documents that I was going to inherit. I knew everything. So if there is corruption, if there is cheating, if there is, I will know. The only thing is maybe one or two people will come again and say, oh God, this has been the way we are doing. But if you wouldn't mind, if you touch here, you will, uh, this, this, this uh, emir will come. If you touch here, this general will come. If you come here, this police, that's the only thing. But you will know everything. As I speak to you, with due respect, the, the current press, uh, I mean, uh, leadership will know everything that is going on there. There is no document that they will ask that the NMPC managing director will not give them. There is no oil field they will want to go to and they will not be able to go to. So that's the only thing I want to say. But if you want to flow along or play along, that's a, a, a different thing entirely. Then when you said that oil companies will have a way of diverting this normal, they cannot divert a, a, a barrel of crude oil. Because every, every drilling rig you go to Oplo station, there are Nigerians. And everywhere you go, there are security agents. So one liter, I mean, one barrel of crude oil cannot get missing. That's the only thing I can tell you. Then some people were thinking before we were losing crude oil to, to smugglers. It's not correct. Smugglers were not stealing anything. It was just manipulation. Because I grew up in Port Harcourt, or I, I'm a product of Uniport. In those days, there was NAFCON, National Fertilizer Co of Ni uh, Corporation of Nigeria also, National Fertilizer Company. I, I knew Port Harcourt very well till today. I'm, I'm still based in Port Harcourt. In those days, you know, to produce fertilizer, fertilizer is a mixture, mixture of sand and, a, and some chemicals, urea and the rest. I knew people as far back then, that will supply 10 tipas of uh, sand and they will make it 70 or 100. So if they say we were importing 50 million liters or 70 million liters, it's possible the consumption was not up to that, but not that we were losing it to smugglers. No, it was internal manipulation. Look, everybody, go to all the borders and see. It's not easy for tankers to be driving out every day because probably sometimes 10, 10 kilometers to even the, the borders, there are no filling stations and no tankers are allowed. And even if you say they go through the tankers, why, why do you promote people to controllers of customs and immigration? But it was not through tankers, it's internal manipulation. Let me tell you, it was not smuggling. That's just the truth. So we know the quantity we produce. Ask any production engineer, they will tell you. They know it. Like I said, when the crude oil comes, it goes to the separator. They remove sand, they remove, we know all those ones. So even that is manipulation, like what was happening in NAFCON. Anybody that knew NAFCON and Potacon will tell you. And I knew some people personally, personally. So I'm, I'm not telling you because of what I thought. I knew them personally. I go to their houses then at Oné. They, they will be manipulating the, 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 the volumes of the quantity of tipas. And it's not different. And the reason why I still kept, I didn't want to respond to other questions is because I, I don't know the, the, the refineries that, they, that, that do the refining. I don't know how much they agree with NMPC. So if I give you any word now, even if the difference, even if what I tell you very, has a variance of 10 Naira, NMPC will accuse me for that. They will say, say I gave a false figure. So that is the reason. First of all, I don't know which of the refineries they, they were using. I don't know what they agreed with the, with the accountants. I don't know what they signed. I don't know what the agreement. So if I give, that will be risky. 
Anybody that has some understanding of law will know that I mean, I, 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 I can be liable. So that's just what I want to shy away from. But there are some hard facts like production volume, production quota, recount, and other things, the principle of, of refining, the principle of subsidy, the principle of deregulation, privatization, commercialization, and, and deregulation. Those, I can argue them to any point because they are principles and they are facts. But what they agree, the documents they sign, nobody sees them apart from the main officials. But I know if the president say, I want to see your direct supply, direct purchase agreement documents, he will be shown. Nobody can, can, can hide those. He is on seat. Once you are on seat, whether as a chairman or president or minister or commissioner, you will see all the documents of your predecessors. Thank you. Strategically. Okay, Sonny, do you have any questions, or Jumoke? Do you have any questions, any comments, so that we can close the no, meeting? I think we can close, Pastor. We don't have any questions. Do you have any comments? Um. Well, you had said we are going to talk about. Obviously, we couldn't get into any other thing. So, Balazaka, we'll just get you some other time. It, it, it's um, not possible. It's not Only fuel subsidy has taken the whole day. <laughs> he may want to make a comment on uh, what you may call foreign exchange. He did say so, but um, uh, okay. fuel subsidy. We, we don't have the, the time again. Day. It's already seven o eight. So let's close. Maybe we'll invite him back another day. Yeah. Then we can look at the. Although by that time, this issue of ministerial list would have been. Uh, you know, it's been a very Except if we're going to continue next week, ministerialists will be uh, time bad. Irrelevant. I think we'll have uh, no so we can look at foreign exchange and ministerialists next. I don't often tell people, but it could be perfectly authentic. Yeah. So maybe we can. I'm sick of talking about what I did for money. I literally hurt people. I'm a little bit embarrassed about it. That? I'm talking about things in a way that I didn't talk about. I'm talking about it. I'm glad you're going to be proud of the video. Jumoke, I can't hear you. I didn't say anything, sir. Okay. Sonny? Yes? We'll discuss or, or who is on the program next week. I'll find out from Olu. Okay. And then we can then see if next week is possible or when next to bring on our, our very passionate guest. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, very passionate, comrade. Thank you very much. It's been okay. a good can I uh, exercise. Summarize? I like can your I passion. Summarize? I don't know where in Nigeria. Uh? Can I quickly just summarize with one or two bullet points? Or if the time is up, no problem. On what? Well, I just want to one let them, bullet... sir. I just want to let people understand. Uh, everybody listening here. Nigeria, for a country that has more than 100 polytechnics and 100 universities, if anybody tells you that the refining is complicated, anybody who tells you that wants to justify why we are not having functional refinery, honestly, that person is, the enemy, is an enemy of Nigeria. And anybody who tells you that bosses, and cars are the things that we need. It's, it, that person is not honest. Many people stay in their houses. What we need is energy. We need energy security. So anybody who tells you that they will bring 10,000 cars, divide that by 774 local governments in the Federation. It's not fair. Honestly, our leaders are not fair. What, what, some of us can stay in our houses for two weeks without going out. So who says it's bosses that we need? How many people even go out? What is, there are no businesses, but people stay inside and, and internally create. So please, all I just want to say, let's not accept these lies. They are lies. They are lies. Nigeria is too rich for anybody to lie. And there are technocrats. Let's also not continue to support technocrats that have reduced themselves to praise singers and propagandists. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll take that as your final comments. And then we'll do a back end uh, listen and we'll see when I discuss with Olu.
Um, there have been no other comments from anyone. It is just for me to thank our beloved comrade for his passion, for his eloquence, and uh, all that he has thrown himself into uh, in this issue. Uh, maybe when next we have you, you still try and do your homework and explain to me exactly how much is the subsidy and how much is Nigeria really losing, or is there any subsidy at all? Because what you've described to me looks like... Uh, Pastor, we can't hear you anymore. Okay. So thank you all, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. We're grateful to God for this um, the, um, um, evening's work. And um, we look forward to seeing you same time next week, by God's grace. Comrade, thank you very much. Uh, you and I should please get in touch and we can have uh, a quick meeting on one or two other issues. Thank you. God bless you all. Have a great weekend.